Many years ago, something that had a great influence on me, I spoke on the same stage as a prominent Zimbabwean farmer who wept as he spoke of how he regretted that when they came to him, he did not tell his fellow countrymen what he feared the evidence clearly to show about the trajectory of that country, but told them instead, in the face of the evidence, what he knew they wanted to hear, that it would all be all right. His great regret was had they known what was coming, they might have averted disaster. So I will tell you what I and my colleagues believe the evidence now shows and how we need to respond if we are to avert a disaster. The context against which the current expropriation without compensation question has arisen is rarely articulated in the public domain, but it is nevertheless essential to understanding both the crisis the government is hurtling towards and how to counter it. One of the stupidest things the National Party ever did was in the 1950s and 1960s to hound a fairly moderate ANC into the arms of the Soviet Union and the East Germans. The Soviet embrace infused much hard left thinking into the party which culminated in the ANC's 1969 endorsement of the theory of national democratic revolution which had earlier in 1962 been taken on board by the South African Communist Party. NDR theory or theory of national democratic revolution is based on Lenin's theory of imperialism that the wealth of colonial powers arises solely from the oppression and the exploitation of the colonized. From this foundation, Lenin argued that the purpose of anti-colonial revolutions must always be to dispossess the colonizer and then embrace communism, failing which the colonized could never be free. The Communist Party made this theory applicable to South Africa by developing the notion of a colonialism of a special type to mean that both the colonizer and colonized live together inside the same country into which the colonizer had become permanently, permanently integrated. But the argument went that despite that integration, white and capitalist prosperity remained solely the result of the, of the oppression and the exploitation of the black majority and indeed caused and prolonged that poverty and that the colonizer, despite his integration, would have to be dispossessed if the colonized were ever to be free. And the ANC has annually recommitted to the NDR right up to this year. Matters took a turn in Davos in 1991, when Nelson Mandela delivered an address in which he appeared to jettison such revolutionary dogma. The back story is that he had at great personal risk to himself because the ANC had yet to hold a policy conference, rewritten the paragraphs of the address that had been prepared for him on economic policy. He emerged from Davos and the encouragement he received on the back of that address and an engagement he'd had with the Chinese to tell his party that Afro-socialist experiments had failed across the subcontinent and that South Africa would pursue a more pragmatic path. He also lent his gravitas to his de facto Prime Minister Thabo Mbeki, who was then able to drive the growth, employment and redistribution or gear policy. And this policy was for most intents and purposes, and despite its internal contradictions, mostly common sense that respected property rights, the primacy of the private sector and the importance of a market economy. During the Mbeki years, the pragmatism of gear coupled with a measure of very good fortune, saw a budget deficit that had been inherited by the ANC at in 1994 at levels of around negative 5% transform into a surplus 13 years later, a remarkable achievement for an emerging market. The debt to GDP ratio was halved and the economic growth rate that had been catastrophic in the 1980s. In 1990, South Africa was on a per capita GDP basis 20% poorer than it had been in 1980. Mbeki saw that economic growth picture reverse. The growth rate would average 3% between 1994 and 2003. And between 2004 and 2007, the economy would maintain a growth rate of 5% of GDP 
the first time this had happened for four consecutive years since 1970. The results in terms of living standards, jobs and the rollout of welfare were impressive. And the ANC and South Africa's people never received the due credit to people most importantly for the progress the country would make through the Mbeki era. If you doubt that, consider that the number of people with a job would double through the Mbeki years. For every shack newly erected in that era, ten formal houses were being built in the, con on, in the country. In the early 1990s, 40 whites were getting an, a degree in engineering for every black graduate, but by 2007, there were twice as many black as white engineering graduates, even though the number of white graduates was no less than it had been in the early 1990s. Public opinion measured both in polling terms and in terms of the ANC's electoral performance would peak. And Mr. M but Mr. Mbeki's ideological adversaries, despite the progress within the ANC and the Communist Party, seethed with resentment at what they saw as a betrayal of the revolution. As Mr. Mandela's influence faded, Mr. Mbeki would go on to make two unrelated strategic mistakes that would later intersect to bring us exactly to the crisis point that we face today. The first of these was to send the charismatic but deeply flawed Jacob Zuma to wrest from Butelezi and Natal the Zulu nationalist in Carter vote, something that Mr. Mandela had failed to achieve and something that Mr. Mbeki could obviously not achieve. But Mr. Mbeki does this without appreciating that if Mr. Zuma is successful where he and Mr. Mandela had failed, that Mr. Zuma would come to inherit the mantle of Zulu nationalism and wield this as a weapon in the ANC exactly as was to come to pass. The second mistake was on HIV and AIDS. And here Mr. Mbeki's missteps allowed the long isolated left within the ANC to regroup to fundraise and to develop platforms of influence and credibility in attacking his HIV and AIDS policies, platforms that they would later use to stunning effect to attack Mr. Mbeki's economic policies as well and to turn public and popular opinion against him. Those two mistakes led to Mr. Mbeki's defeat at an ANC policy conference in Polokwane in 2007. The left was happy to exploit Mr. Zuma's ethnic populism and nationalism to eject Mr. Mbeki, while Mr. Zuma was happy to ride the wave of ideologically inspired anti-Mbeki media sentiment that had been crafted by the left. Other than that, the two groups had nothing in common with each other and were in many respects arch enemies. After Polokwane, Mr. Zuma and his camp would go on to loot the state while the left was allowed to claw back control to use the revolutionary term of the levers of policy power and influence that had been denied to them since Davos in 1991. That those two shifts further coincided with the global financial crisis 18 months later created the perfect policy, governance and economic storm and the results for our country were catastrophic. Debt levels more than doubled. The budget deficit again plumbed apartheid-era lows. Fixed investment flows fell through the floor, and the growth rate that had maintained levels of 5% into 2007 would fall year after year to bottom out at 0.6% in 2016. From 2013, and certainly 2000, earlier, 2012 in fact, much of the emerging world was growing out of the financial crisis, but South Africa's economic growth rate took a unique trajectory downwards and job creation virtually came to a halt. The political consequences were as severe. Popular confidence in the future of the country is down 40 percentage points from that of a decade ago. Violent anti-government protest actions are up almost 300%. And these and other trends generated for ANC leaders the once unthinkable proposition that the party might surrender its control of the country and that it might do so as early as 2019. That fear triggered an internal power struggle between the left and the looters as both sides sought to escape responsibility for the ANC's reversals, a fight that the left would ultimately win 
through using the thesis of state capture to sufficiently discredit Mr. Zuma that they could bring Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa to power as ANC leader. However, this was by the narrowest of margins, 179 votes out of 4,700 delegates. And while state capture had undoubtedly done extraordinary damage to our country, it was only part of the problem, and in our judgment, not the leading part. The real, the deeper, and the broadly unacknowledged source of the crisis we confront today, particularly after 2013, as South Africa's growth trajectory departed from that of the rest of the world, is that after Polokwane, the 2007 conference, the ANC turned its back on Mandela's 1991 ideological reformation and allowed the cabinet again to champion hard left status policies from the cancellation of bilateral investment treaties to mad new immigration rules, the national health insurance scheme, higher minimum wages, the draft mining charter, to mention just a few, that vilified the market economy, property rights and racial minorities as obstacles to social and economic progress and obstacles to the liberation of black South Africans, while fending off critical scrutiny of those policies by appealing to base racial nationalist sentiment around questions of transformation and empowerment. And the manner in which that sentiment was unquestioningly taken on board in the media, in much of civil society, in the political opposition and in the business community was the single greatest success of NDR strategists and is directly responsible as much as anything else for the crisis the country today confronts. Today, those same ideologues that engineered the crisis are still in the cabinet, where they are still pressing ahead with the National Health Insurance Scheme, which is essentially expropriation without compensation for the private health care industry, a mining charter that contains provisions that amount to expropriation without compensation of mining investment, all the while turning the screws on ever more onerous racial empowerment dictates. What the agriculture sector is experiencing now is therefore not unique. An expropriation without compensation has and will continue to spread its tentacles to wherever there is wealth to be extracted or colonial relics to be destroyed. Nor, as some analysts continue to suggest, does the present threat to property rights owe its origins to the ANC policy conference last December and can it be regarded simply as a short-term political stratagem that will be abandoned as soon as the next election has passed. There is a clear pattern of policy that predates that conference and that continues unabated today. To trace that pattern and its more recent origins, I take you back to at least 2007 and the attack on the willing buyer, willing seller policy that was so fervent at the ANC conference in Pulakwane and that would later inform the content of the draft expropriation bill of 2008, which contained within it provisions that amounted to EWC. That in turn informed the dropping of the proactive land acquisition strategy 18 months later, the policy of the Mbeki era, the plus the acquisition strategy, whereby the state would purchase commercial farms and make them available to black commercial farmers who would have title to those properties. A year later, after the plus strategy is cancelled, we see the drafting of the Agricultural Green Paper, which forewarned of every risk from land ceilings to EWC, and all of which would be drafted into policy and legislation within the next six years. Hot on the heels of the Green Paper comes the 20% proposal in the National Development Plan of 2012, the idea that if farmers surrender 20% of their properties, they would be protected against future land claims that some farmers bought into this idea showed a great extent of naivety. The precedent having been conceded, it was simply a matter of time before the 20% number was hiked upwards. That would happen within a year when the government came out with a 50-50 proposal hot on the heels of the 20% in the National Development Plan. A year after that, we had the Restitution Amendment Act that sought to provoke hundreds of thousands of new land claims without the budget to finance them. The subsequent Property Valuation Act, via which the state sought to escape the budgetary bind, would allow the state to appoint a valuer general 
who would value your property and determine the amount of compensation you might receive. Some years after that, the regulations were published according to which the valuer general would value your property, and our reading of those valuations made it quite clear that the valuation could easily be zero, depending on the history of acquisition of that property. After the Property Valuation Act came the Agriculture Land Bill, via which the state sought to, make, via which the state sought to become custodian of all agricultural land, just as the Green Paper had warned a few years previously, and thereby escaping any budgetary bind at all. After that, we got the Regulation of Land Holdings Bill that would cap farm sizes and force farmers to surrender the surplus, and now we sit with a proposed amendment to the Constitution itself. Yet even this chronology, and I don't expect you to follow it because it's very complicated, and I have to sit with my analysts around the table where they make it clear to me one step at a time what has happened. Even that chronology that I've listed to you contains just around 10 of the prominent markers in the pattern, when our analysts tracked a total of 35 separate legislative policy and regulatory steps to erode property rights broadly since 2017, all of which built one upon the other in a systemic and ordered manner. What South Africa's farmers face today is therefore not about poverty or public pressure or even land itself. They have been swept up in a far deeper political and ideological conflict. The battle of ideas over whether South Africa will survive as a free, modern and open society or whether it will sink into a socialist and later communist morass of poverty, oppression and state control. It is no exaggeration to say that what we face today is a battle for the very survival of the Judeo-Christian ethic in Southern Africa. And what farmers face and what will happen to them is very much the litmus test of who will win that battle, meaning that given what is at stake, that in, all, that in many respects all South Africans are commercial farmers today. For the time being, however, farmers will remain very much on the sharp end of that battle, given the extent to which a decade of virtually unchallenged, hate-filled, racist rhetoric and propaganda and falsehood has been directed against them and what they represent, that they stole the land, that they abused their workers, that they refused to work towards a better South Africa. Have no doubt that the propaganda was intentional to so stigmatize farmers that no one would dare to come to their defense when the government inevitably turned on them and used their case to erode property rights, not just with respect to land, but across the economy. It was a terrible mistake, therefore, for the agricultural industry not to challenge the propaganda, just as it was a terrible mistake to dismiss the post-2007 policy pattern and the ideology that underpinned it. All were parallel and related processes designed to checkmate the industry into negotiating the terms of its own demise within frames of reference set by its ideological opponents, a process from which you can draw a direct line to Mr Ramaphosa's announcements last week. As you break down the myths and the falsehoods, you realise that EWC is not about land at all, but about four other things. It is first an incompetent attempt to outmanoeuvre the EFF on land, but that has backfired spectacularly, with the EWC issue creating new and previously undreamed of political platforms for the EFF, such as their virtual chairing of the public land hearings, although we have ever more reason to believe that the two parties are working hand in glove towards their later reunification. The second is an attempt to extend as a general principle of law the idea of a regulatory or custodial taking and thereby eroding property rights generally, something that can succeed minus a constitutional amendment. Land is just the thin end of the wedge, as the current NHI policy proposal reveals. The third is to try and unite the tripartite alliance. Unity is a greater policy priority for the ANC than reform, and to unite a political movement you need an enemy and the years of mostly unchallenged political and media propaganda directed against commercial farmers has allowed the government to portray them today as an enemy of the people. The fourth is to open the way to the erosion of civil rights broadly, 
given the likely future threats to the ruling party's political hegemony, and given that property rights anchor human liberty in all free societies. Step by step, the components of a downward economic, social and political spiral are assembled and set into motion. Whether these dangers can be countered and later reversed depends on one thing alone, the future trajectory of South Africa's battle of ideas. Battle of ideas theory, in which we are much practiced, holds that the winner of any public policy struggle will ultimately be the side that injects the greatest volume of compelling argument into the public domain. Hence, Farmer's current predicament at the end of a decade of virtually unanswered public stigmatization. The IRI's ethos and methods, the group I work for, are aligned very closely with the idea that the war in Vietnam was lost in America's living rooms and on the streets of Washington and not in the jungles of Southeast Asia. Put differently, it is the ability to shape and command public opinion that determines public policy. This is something the ANC understands very well, and their strategy and tactics documents are a virtual masterclass in the theory. It is quite pointless in our experience of many decades to believe that your salvation rests in the courts or other forms of civil action or that you will be able to convince a politician to change his or her mind if the political leadership of the country cannot at the same time be convinced that the balance of power in public opinion is turned against them. And I am ever more certain as one of the great veterans of these battles put it to me in my office recently, that the ANC will not change its mind on this issue. It has gone too far down that road now, but it may change its perception of the balance of forces in public opinion, and only then may it pull back. Public opinion is the most powerful policy asset there is. As long as that opinion continues to be driven in favor of statist economic interventions, South Africans have ever diminishing odds of securing their future, for living in a free and open society. The agricultural industry and business in general, I'm afraid, remains virtually absent from the battle for public opinion, while the political opposition is close to useless, and organized business remains so enraptured with the new administration that they cannot see where the country is being led. All that is left is you, the individual and whether you will get into this fight because if you do then the tide may just turn but before you do that you need to make a decision a decision that you're not going to sit back and put up with the abuse the insults the racism the vilification and the threats that you're going to stand up and fight this thing on your side are millions of people just like you we see them in our polling hard-working, God-fearing, law and order people, black and white, who want exactly what you want for our country. They are the silent majority, and your example will help them to speak up. My colleagues and I at the IRR fight this fight for you every day to counter the stigmatization, to mitigate the most destructive of the government's proposals, to educate the public of the consequences, to hold the line on the importance of property rights and to use all that to turn public opinion in order and time to turn the policy. Our efforts, as just one example, and we don't always go into the detail, have secured to date this year over 750 opinion articles, letters and interviews and related media citations. We've lobbied directly over 80 extremely influential groups, as influential as you get both here and in Europe and in America. We've left the ANC and the South African government in no doubt as to the political and economic hell they are marching themselves towards and that if they continue down this road, one day the poor will hang them from the lampposts outside Latuli House. Join us in this fight or you will remain isolated and alone, frightened and powerless and you will be ground down and eventually wiped out. But by force of numbers, we can better prosecute the battle of ideas and turn public opinion, opening the way to sane policies that will respect property rights in South Africa's future as a market economy and thereby the future as a constitutional democracy.
On our side is the fact that change in societies happens at points of crisis. And South Africa is moving very rapidly, hurtling, in fact, towards its next crisis. And the direction of the change that comes in a society will usually follow that of the group that had the greatest influence on public opinion at the time of the crisis. Crisis is not far away. The government is hurtling towards it. And South Africa will be in near catastrophic social, economic and political peril within a few short years. With your support, we increase the odds and the probability that when South Africa hits that next major crisis, the ideas we have articulated will define the policies that are adopted in the era that follows the crisis. I cannot guarantee you that we will win because it is late in the day and now more apparent than ever that those who against our repeated advice and in the face of the evidence assured you that there was nothing to fear have been wrong all along. But I can tell you that we will fight this thing as hard as we can until there is nothing left so that we know we did all we could. And you must fight now too so that you will also know that, that you did not walk away quietly into the night. But I can guarantee you that if you do not fight this thing, this is a battle that you are going to lose.